Let's give praise to the one who's brought us here again. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to teach and to learn, to understand your book better, to understand by this book ourselves better, and so that we might treat others better. And our focus should be on those who have yet to hear and those who need our help to share the good news and to do good because of it. We thank you for Jesus. Amen. When I was studying in Israel, 1979-1980, a couple of uh, my compatriots with me were in the old city of Jerusalem. And we were walking through the streets, and we came upon uh, this very interesting kind of circle of folks. And in the middle of the circle, there was an older woman and a younger boy, looked like a teenage boy. And we kind of came upon this gathering, and we were standing outside of this. And all of what I'm about to tell you, I found out after the fact, because we don't speak modern Hebrew. And so we were watching this particular event. And as we understood it from uh, the translation of from others afterwards, the, there was, this was a mother and a son. And the mother would say one thing to the son, and the son would report in some nasty response that teenagers around the world are wont to do. <laughs> so this was back and forth, back and forth, and the voices were going up and up and up. At some juncture, the young man said something, and the mother was just beside herself, beyond capability of response. And then she did something that I will never forget as you might imagine, still etched in my mind. She gathered her skirts and lifted them, pointed to herself, and said, don't ever forget where you came from. I have never seen that. I do not want to see it here. Uh, Please only use this as an example, an illustration of what we are about to talk about, which is nakedness and covering. But more than that, it is about the issue of threads that run through the fabric of the scriptures. And beyond that, it is about the people of the Bible, and it's the people of today, and it's the fact that these kinds of ideas resonate with us in ways that we sometimes don't always get. And so that image in my mind is one that identifies the very issues that we are going to talk about this morning. This idea of the threads of scripture that run through the concepts of the Bible from beginning to end. So when we talk about nakedness and covering as one thread that's woven through the fabric of scripture, we find this, as you might recall, early on in chapter 2 of Genesis, where at the end of chapter 2, it is said that the man and the woman were naked, but they felt no shame. This was pre-fall. This was before sin. And so this shamelessness before sin obviously is immediately reversed after sin. In fact, it's the very first thing that's identified and noticed in chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, that they saw themselves and realized they were naked, and they hid and covered themselves. And there's a slew of... Uh, identifiers that runs through just those two verses by themselves, chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. But this concept of nakedness and covering begins in Genesis. It is something that we will see over and over and over again as we study the Bible. So, remember that we are in a class on Old Testament overview, and we have talked about the big picture of what that means, and what does it look like to see the Old Testament, the First Testament as we call it, to understand its wholeness. Well, one of the ways that we can understand its wholeness is because of all of these threads, I call them, running through the fabric of this book. And these threads all link to create this marvelous tapestry of a whole view of God's world and his message. And so this concept of nakedness and covering is just simply one of those threads. Here's a portrait, uh, an, ample, an old portrait, 17th century portrait, of uh, the man and the woman who have just... Uh, understood their sinfulness and are trying to hide from God who uh, comes into the garden 
And notice that when we talk about the book of Genesis, and we talk about chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, that it is human beings who attempt in their own ways to cover themselves. So there's this attempt, humanly speaking, to take care of our sinfulness. Gee, do we see that at all in our culture today? Nothing has changed. I have this sign uh, that a student has made for me, and I, it is prominent in my study. Come to visit, and I will show it to you. And it says, ever since Genesis 3, dot, dot, dot. I use that phrase so much because nothing has changed since Genesis 3. So our attempt to cover ourselves, to cover up, to cover over, to get away from, by some way uh, covering ourselves, is exactly our problem today. And God provides the covering, if you remember in chapter 3, verse 21. It says that God has, had actually provided a covering that was sufficient for them. Their covering was insufficient. Nakedness and covering, one of the key elements, one of the key threads that runs through Scripture. Well, one of the places that you will find this is in the book of Ezekiel. And quite frankly, uh, I don't want to read Ezekiel 16 to you because I would be embarrassed. Did you realize, by the way, that there are numerous passages in the Bible uh, that I would not read to you because I would be embarrassed? I'm thinking about Leviticus 11 to 15, for instance. You will thank Jesus that I never read Leviticus 11 to 15 out loud. I surely hope that you will go read it, however, on your own. But those are the kinds of things that we understand about the Bible. The Bible is very specific. It is out there. It tells us in plain language what we are thinking and what we are doing and how we respond uh, to God and his word. So in Ezekiel chapter 16, God is painting this picture of Israel as a whore, as a prostitute, as someone who has uh, gone after the idolatry of the day. And over and over and over again, this word in the English, whore, is used over and over and over again. In fact, it's used as a verb, whoring, all the way through this particular passage. But what's the tie to all of this is nakedness. God says, I found you naked in chapter 16, Ezekiel. I found you naked, and I covered you, and I gave you fine jewels and great garments and all these wonderful things. And then you went pouring after other gods, and you gave up your clothing. And so God says, because you did that, I'm going to expose your nakedness. In fact, he goes so far as to say, I'm going to expose it all. And I'm thinking again about the mother in the town square in the old city of Jerusalem. You played the whore, multiplying your whorings. I will uncover your nakedness to them, and they will see it all. They will see it all. The thread that runs through Scripture, well, here is yet another example of this. In Hebrews chapter 4, this is one that hits very close to home for all of us. This is the one that begins in uh, cha chapter 4 and verse 12 of Hebrews, uh, where it says that uh, this word of God is quick and sharp and will cut asunder uh, soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Uh, this is the kind of idea that we come from here when we think about nakedness and covering now. When we think about our sinfulness, this is what Hebrews 4.13 says, everything will be uncovered and made naked. That word, by the way, in some translations is given as made or made bare, laid bare, to expose the neck uh, to the knife, literally, uh, to be killed in that way. But this is the concept that we find in Hebrews chapter 4, to make naked before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I'm not so sure if that bothers you, but it sure bothered me. And it sure, certainly is something, once again, that we see this concept, this thread of nakedness running through Scripture. So there is a covering, however. And one of the key concerns, obviously 321 in Genesis, we've already know, noted that, is this concern for a covering. Will there be someone to cover us? Will there be a covering for us? that we might be seen standing before God, and the covering, of course, is Jesus. This uh, statement in chapter 3, verse 18, was made to the church at Laodicea. And specifically, uh, God says to them, you need white garments to clothe the shame of your nakedness. And then he goes on uh, later on in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, where Jesus comes out of heaven with the armies of heaven coming in linen, white, pure robes. So when we think about a thread that begins in Genesis and goes all the way through the Bible to the book of Revelation, 
we see once again this connectivity, the threads of these concepts that run all the way through the Bible. There are so many of them, we don't even have time to scratch the surface of them, but to point out some of them to make sure that we get the general concept. Another point of covering, specifically an anticipation of Jesus, it says in Isaiah 61, he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. This is Isaiah in anticipation of the one who will take care of this for us, Jesus. We long for God's covering that we might no longer be naked. This uh, statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is a fantastic statement. Uh, we find ourselves here in this passage where uh, Paul is explaining what it's like to live in the tent of earthly existence and look forward to living in the temple of heaven. But he goes further than that and he brings up the concept of nakedness again. He said the only way that we're going to be covered, understanding first of all that we're naked and we can't do it by ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. These threads, these pieces of fabric need to be understood and sewn together. And so on your handouts, I think this is on there uh, at some point, I've written threads, small fibers or strands, unite to produce one piece of fabric so that scripture's purpose is captured in many threads throughout the book. And there are so many of them, we see them constantly over and over and over again. As you read the Bible, these things will begin to stand out. And what you begin to realize is, hey, they had their origin way back in Genesis. And I see them over and over and over again, even into Revelation. And so the concept of threads is huge. The fact that we actually have to have a loom, however, is an important concept. That is, there is going to be one person namely God himself through his spirit, who is going to help us to not only understand this book, but to see how it interconnects. So, pause here to just give a shout out to anybody in Bible study. Throughout all of the years of my teaching, I've emphasized uh, this to my students, that we need to use OICA. Uh, OICA is an acronym. It stands for Observation, Interpretation, Correlation, and Application. The C, correlation, is one that's often left out. Correlation suggests that as we read the Bible, there are all these interconnective ideas. And the question in correlation is, how does the Bible fit together? How does this one concept that we're studying here fit with all these other concepts that we see throughout the scriptures? Well, that's what we need to understand about the Bible study itself, that it shows the seamlessness of interpretation and the fabric of God's word is seen to be held together. And this, by the way, I, I would go quickly to say, is a very strong apologetic for the Christian faith. Let me just give a word for what apologetics means. Apologetics means that we are defending the faith. So apologetics means that we are giving answers to people, that famous line in 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer to him who asks the hope which is in you. And so this concept of an apologetic, we are giving a defense of the faith, one of the keys to understanding the Bible is the unity of it. The thing doesn't fall apart. We're not just talking about these nice little aphorisms and dictates, you know, laws here and a few speeches over here, and we really don't see how they all fit together. Man, you read the Bible, <laughs> you don't get anything but unity when you begin to read it as a whole. And so this emphasis on the exclusivity of the gospel, that there's only one way. Acts 4.12 says, there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. And so the concept of unity truly comes through in something that we're talking about this morning, which is the concept of threads that run through the scriptures. Now, I gave you this uh, uh, slide a few weeks ago. In fact, I tried to put it on the handouts, and I noticed after I printed them that they came out pretty dark. So if you're at all interested in this, please go back uh, to not only our websites, warpandwoof.org or cominiusinstitute.com, uh, but also the church website where all of these things are already put up for you. Uh, some of the great work that folks uh, that are working for us, uh, Liz Taping and Josh Collingswood, our guy behind the scenes taking care of the technology. But you can pick up these things uh, in other episodes, as it were. So you're seeing the unity, Genesis 1 to 3, uh, with Revelation 19 to 22. And I highlight this again. I just kind of put this back up as an exclamation point. To say the same thing that we've been talking about all the way through is exactly what we're saying here today. So, you want to talk about threads? <laughs> I just put down a few. There are just a few threads here. 
Creator, creation, law, knowledge, land, seed, and blessing, right, by the way, out of Genesis 12. Exile and return is a huge thread that runs through the Bible. The word holy or kingship, oh my word, I could spend a whole fall semester just talking about kingship in the Bible. Servanthood, life, death. And then if you'll notice at the top of your uh, handouts, we actually have a statement about the prophet, uh, which is an important one that speaks again uh, to Jesus as, as uh, Moses is anticipating him uh, Moses says, obviously through the, the Spirit, God will raise up a prophet like me from among you. Guess where that's quoted? In the Second Testament, in the Gospel of John, and then again in the book of Acts. How about that? And you'll never guess who it references. Oh, I'm sure you don't know. Jesus. Just in case you're <laughs> stumped on that one there. You know, that's... All kinds of things. Wrath, love, glory, righteousness, wisdom, sin, redemption. Follow the threads all the way through the scriptures. There are so many of them that stand out when you begin to think this way about how the Bible is unified and how it under, uh, should be understood as a whole book. Now, I brought with me today uh, my copy of this book that I highly recommend that you go get a copy of yourself. So because this was printed a few years ago, uh, you can actually uh, get a used copy and have it sent to your house with shipping for less than $20. Yes, you know, I'm promoting Mr. Bezos here and his uh, great work at Amazon. But nonetheless, uh, the point is that this is a great book. And if you at all care about studying the Bible, this is a book that you ought to have on your shelf. For 20 bucks, you can't beat this thing. Look how thick it is. Let's just talk about how thick this thing is, first of all. So I mentioned to you perhaps in other uh, sessions that we've had together, a name, uh, Leland Riken. Leland Riken has been teaching at Wheaton College for 50 years. His, his uh, son is now the president there, Philip Riken. I emphasize this because it's he and his dad uh, that put together uh, this, or his son, this literary Bible uh, that we uh, mentioned a few weeks ago. This particular work came out of a lot of folks contributing to this, but the emphasis is you can look up any pictorial, visual concept, any image in the Bible, and it's here. It's fully explained. It's given to you from the beginning to the end of Scripture. I highly recommend this book. Did you get that? I want you to run out and buy this book if you're at all interested in studying the Bible. You can tell my dedication to this because I put it in my bag and I lugged it over here today. There you go. So, I emphasize the title of this particular slide, A Word Paints a Thousand Pictures. We often hear it said the other way around. But frankly, I'm telling you that I think that words matter more than pictures. In fact, if you read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, this is God's concern that people would begin to worship the things that they see in heaven on earth and under the earth. But here we find that in a book like this, we find over and over and over again these images create these new pictures in our mind. So I actually made up this poem. I think this was about 2 o'clock this morning, so there you go. <laughs> the visual and verbal made, the verbal and visual displayed. This concept of how we see the verbal and the visual connecting with each other is very important. And something else that I think is important, as we talked earlier in, in other uh, lessons about this, we see best by what we hear first. Remember that the book that we're studying, this Old Testament, First Testament book, was first given to the hearing of the people. We read it, for the most part. They heard it for the most part. So I mentioned this, uh, I give you this slide again about Jeremiah chapter 2. I told this story about uh, rural students explaining what it meant to ha uh, see animals in heat and the eye wide mouth drop of uh, suburban or urban kids because they'd never heard such things before. So when we talk about the connections that we are seeing in Scripture, understand that these visual images are things that people in that culture immediately understood. And that's why we need books like this and help us in understanding the study of Scripture so that we can get a better understanding of places like Jeremiah chapter 2. Now, I just wanted to pop out a couple of other threads that kind of give us uh, an overview of some major ideas, uh, I think, that are really important. So I want to emphasize at least two here uh, for us today outside of nakedness and covering. One of them is about the priest. And this concept of the priest in First Testament teaching is really important, and I think one that gets, uh, we get to the point best if we understand what a transformer is. 
I don't, I'm not an electrician, nor am I the son of an electrician, okay? I do not understand electricity. Don't talk to me about what watts and volts. I'll get it wrong, I'm sure. But what I do know is that transformers take the huge surges of electricity and they make it possible for us to blow dry our hair in the morning. Those of us who have enough hair to blow dry, that is. So this concept of transformer is exactly the image that we should have in our mind when we think about a priest. Because in First Testament teaching, the priest was the go-between, the stand-between, the transformer between God and his people. Remember that there was only the high priest that got to go into the Holy of Holies once a year. When you read First Testament teaching in places like Leviticus, or in Exodus, where you see the priest going in, the high priest going into the temple, uh, into the temple precincts, the Holy of Holies, one time a year. And the reason for that is because the priest was the one who was to step down the power of God so that people could get it without being blown away, like they almost were in Exodus chapter 20 on Mount Sinai. We see our responsibility in places like Exodus chapter 19, Revelation 1, and chapter 5. The same concepts of priests that were given in First Testament teaching are our responsibility. Israel was to be a kingdom of priests to all the other nations. They were to be the go-between to get the power of God to people so that they could understand it and not get blown away by it. They are stepping down the power. So important is the power of God in this. When you read Leviticus 8 to 10, for instance, and you find out that because the priests did one thing wrong, they were immediately executed. This is in a very important concept that we get our wrap our minds around for the people of Israel in First Testament teaching. And there's much more to say about all of that, but we, what we want to say is that the priest is the go-between, the transformer between God and people. So how do people see God's power today? Well, guess what we're called? First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We are a royal priesthood. What's that mean? We're the go-betweens. This is how we can actually use 110 or 220. Well, I guess this is a 110. So you're, you're using 110 over here in your plugs when you plug in whatever it is that you plug in. And this is what our responsibility is. So that people see us as the priests and get to know God because of us. Later in that verse, it says that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Gee, does that sound vaguely familiar? What other places do we see that? Oh, well, a place like Isaiah, chapter 61, or chapter 66. These are the concepts, these threads that run all the way through the Bible. Our responsibility as priests, so that we might proclaim the one who has given us this light. Now, there's something else about this thread that's really important when we understand Jesus. So when we read a place like Hebrews chapter 10, for instance, and we understand that the priests in the First Testament were constantly offering sacrifices. Because in the First Testament, sacrifices only covered our problem. Jesus comes and does the sacrifice one time, and he sits down. See, all the other priests in the First Testament, they're all still standing up. Why is that? Because the work's never done. Jesus, one time, and he sits down. What a marvelous physical image of a finished work that we find in Hebrews chapter 10. And this is exactly the concept uh, that we're talking about here, this thread that runs through the Bible. If we're going to talk about priests, we have to talk about the priest, the one who has given himself uh, for us. Of course, that leads us immediately to the concept of sacrifice. So in the ancient Near Eastern world, this is a very important kind of backdrop, historical backdrop to all of this. In the ancient Near Eastern world, People were trying to appease the gods. If you've ever seen any kind of movies like uh, Joe versus the Volcano, you know Tom Hanks. If you've seen any of these kinds of movies, you know that there is the, these mythological concepts of, you know, we must sacrifice a virgin to the gods and so we're going to push her into the volcano. You know, you've seen those. You've heard that kind of thing before. Well, that kind of thing is exactly the kind of thing that actually happened in First Testament teaching in other cultures, only that actually happened. They actually sacrificed people to the gods. And they did this because they were trying to appease the wrath of the gods. Well, a great example of this is one of the most famous stories in First Kings chapter 18, when Elijah is versus the prophets of Baal. Now remember that 
Baal was the storm god. He was the one with lightning and thunder and fire, and he could send fire down from heaven. And of course, this, this passage is funny to read. Here's Elijah, you know, watching these 400 priests of Baal, and they're all kind of dancing around, doing their thing, and nothing's coming, you know, from heaven. You know, here's Baal, supposed to be the great thunder, lightning, fire god, and he got nothing. He got nothing coming. And so, what does Elijah say? Man, maybe he's out taking a walk. Or maybe he's, well, maybe he's sitting down in the private room. That's really in the Hebrew, that's what it says. So when we talk about this concept of ancient Near Eastern uh, understanding, these other cultures were trying to get away from their sin by laying out something that they hoped this God would accept. And of course, the end of the story is that fire comes down from heaven when Elijah calls for it, and there you go. In Israel, sacrifice was to be an external demonstration of an internal commitment. This sacrificial system was not so regulated by outside means, it was supposed to be regulated from inside of us. So when we read the book of Leviticus, by the way, we're going to spend a whole session just on Leviticus. When we read this book of Leviticus, we begin to see these first seven chapters in a different way. These are regulations given, yes, these are how our sacrifices to be done, but it's supposed to be driven from an in internal devotion and compulsion. Because does God need our sacrifices? No. What does Psalm 50 say? Those of us who are older remember this hymn, right? I own the cattle on a thousand hills. That's where this comes from, Psalm 50. God says this because he's upset with his people. He's upset with his people because he says, y'all are offering sacrifices, but that's not all I want. I want your obedience. That's the key. And then he goes on in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, to obey is better than to sacrifice. This famous line that comes out of the story of Saul who didn't wipe out the Amalekites like he was supposed to. He kind of held some stuff back, which basically put a little coin in his pocket. That was the basic concept of this. And what does God say to him? I want obedience over sacrifice. And then the famous line out of Malachi chapter 1, where God's getting after his people again, and he says, you guys are offering sacrifices, but you're not bringing the best. You're bringing second-rate material. You're bringing the damaged stuff, and that don't fly. So when we talk about sacrifice, we're talking about all kinds of these ideas that run uh, through Scripture. There's so much that we could say about uh, the con concerns that there are about sacrifices in the Bible, including the concept of blood. So take, for instance, this concept that comes out of Leviticus 17.11, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. So we knew in, well, 3,500 years ago, that blood was the main source of life, that in modern days, we only figured out a couple hundred years ago. But here it is. Blood is the lifeblood, the reason why people live. The source and the emphasis of blood is the key component to the concern about sacrifice and God's uh, anticipation of what uh, would be uh, coming through his son Jesus. If sacrifice didn't take away sin, why sacrifice? Because this was an anticipation of one yet to come. And this was God's a way to help his people to understand to be priests in the culture. What were these sacrifices to be? They were to be pure and innocent and perfect and unblemished. So, comment about movies, as you might well imagine for me. Anytime you see some superhero movie, let me be so bold as to make that point, where some superhero is substituting himself for the people Guess where they got that from? <laughs> Once again, the Bible is being ripped off without attribution. So where does substitutionary atonement come from? Where do we get the sense that there is somebody who gave his blood for us? It's right out of the Bible. That's where we get this from. And this line out of 1 Peter 1, one of the first earliest verses I ever memorized, you were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. This is an important concept. Again, the concept of sacrifice that runs all the way through it, and the idea of substitution that, is, that does not exist in other cultural connections. It's important for us to make those kinds of dif uh, distinctions uh, from those who would suggest that Christianity is just one religion among the, the rest and doesn't really matter. Then, of course, when we get to the concept of Hebrews chapter 9, 
and we see talk about the crucifixion. And here are some of the lines out of Hebrews 9. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. He appeared once for all. He will appear a second time to save those who are waiting for them. When I drive to places, I listen to NPR. When I listen to NPR, I grit my teeth most of the time. But I listen to NPR because it's really important to listen to NPR. There's really some really interesting good stuff there. But you should be in the car with me when I'm listening to NPR. Because I talk to the radio. There's nobody else around. I raise my voice. I shake my finger. Nobody in NPR cares about that, but I'm saying it anyway. So I heard uh, an episode here recently about this concern, a story about forgiveness. And it was really fascinating because I was waiting for the punchline. Like, how can you have forgiveness? How can other people forgive each other? On what basis will this forgiveness be given? And I waited, and I waited, and there was no punchline. Because they got no punch. Because they got no line. Look, the only way you can talk about forgiveness in this culture is if you're talking about a Christian view of things. Because we got the line. And we've been given the punch. And that's because of Jesus' crucifixion on the cross. So listen to these cultural concepts that are coming out, things like substitution or forgiveness, and ask yourself the question, does culture match up to the biblical view of these ideas? And guess what you're going to find every single time? The answer is no, it does not, because it doesn't have the foundational concepts, the foundational ideas, and the person who has made it all possible. So let's talk about applications. And there are all kinds of applications, and I'm just going to talk about applications about sacrifice because I knew that I'd run out of time. So when we talk about Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, this is the most famous one. It's the reason why I put it up here. Uh, when we talk about threads that run through the Bible, we talk about sacrifice, everybody quotes Romans chapter 1, that you are to give your life as a total sacrifice. Well, where does this come from? It comes right out of Leviticus chapter 1 about the burnt offering, where the burnt offering is consuming everything on the funeral, on the pyre, on the fire. And the reason why this is so important and this picture that Paul draws upon from Leviticus is so important is because you're giving your whole self. There's nothing left out of this. Everything is given. Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. There, here's a verse that's not mentioned very often, but a very powerful one as it relates to sacrifice. Financial gifts are sacrifices, and Paul calls them a fragrant offering. Where do you get that concept from? Oh, I don't know. Could it be the First Testament? Yeah. little church lady there for you. <laughs> so financial gifts, when we talk about these ideas, these are offerings. These are sacrifices. And these are things that bring a sweet aroma to heaven. And even that image by itself is an important image. Our behavior is a manifestation of our, our internal devotion. So when we talk about sacrifice, I'm not giving because I have to. I'm giving, as Paul suggested in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, about the poorest people that he dealt with. In verses 1 to 4, he said, The poorest people that I know give more than all of you wealthy Corinthians. He was kind of giving them a little stick for that. This manifestation of an eternal devotion, what are we willing to give up? How much can we give? Again, the sweet aroma to heaven, the applications of sacrifice. And there's more. Here's a couple just from Hebrews chapter 13. We are to offer up a sacrifice of praise. So every time we sin, for instance, as we just did or as you're about to, this is a, a sweet-smelling savor to God, this constant sacrifice coming, all of this billowing up to heaven. And then one of my favorites is Hebrews 13, 16. Do good and share what you have. These are sacrifices to God. Do good, do good, do good, Titus chapter 3 tells us. And we do good because of what the sacrifice was given in Titus chapter 2, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. The only reason why people can do good is if somebody done, had done good before them. In our culture, our culture wants to keep us divided by putting these pieces in between us and trying to separate us out. I was dealing with this again this, uh, last, this last week, uh, interacting with some folks in Baltimore and around the country, 
uh, who are once again asking the question, should we divide in order to do something that's good? That's what our culture wants. It wants us divided. Because in a unity, that's really hard to deal with when everybody comes together, no matter your, your ethnicity or your political views or uh, where you work or what gender you are or what your nationality is or what language you speak. All of those things are set aside. I was talking with a psychologist this week about this. And this very issue, and he said, this is the problem that he sees over and over and over again in any kind of relationship. And he counsels all different kinds of folks. And he listens to all different kinds of people. And he said, this is the real problem. The real problem is the issue of making us divided. And the divisions come in so many different ways. Think about any relationship you might have with anybody and think about what divides us. This is exactly what we are to do. We are to sacrifice ourselves, sharing with others, to do good, and this is pleasing to God. The problem for our culture is that they don't have a loom. They do not have a tapestry weaver. And this is one of my favorite pieces of poetry from Edna St. Vincent Millay, who wrote, Upon this gifted age, in its dark hour, rains from the sky a meteoric shower of facts. And they lie unquestioned, uncombined, Wisdom enough to leech us of our ill is daily spun, but there exists no loom to weave it into fabric. I love that one. There exists no loom to weave it into fabric. This book that we study, these threads that run through the fabric of First Testament, is the loom for the whole of culture. It is the answer to the divisions that divide us. It is the answer to the questions that people raise. It is the way of salvation. There is no other name. And so I give us some questions. Some I'll offer some ideas about. Why is consistency between the Testaments important? Once again, I see this as an apologetic, a defense of the faith, the unity of how we see the message of Christ coming through. This isn't just pockets of little pieces of ideas. These things are woven together with a purpose and the one who made it uh, so, which is the Spirit of God. Why is it that we focus on contrast over connection? I don't know. You know, we, I hear people talk all, all the time, and they'll, they'll use this phrases like this. They'll say, well, that's in the Old Testament. And I'm going, yeah, baby, it's in the Old Testament. Come on, let's talk about that. Not as if this is some kind of dividing line, like, you know, it was different back then. No, it was not different back then. It's the same. Nothing has changed. So what we need to do is we need to see these testaments as more connected than contrast. What benefits are there to practice in correlation? I hope I've given you some ideas about that, the idea that we need to see this interconnectivity, the threads that make up the fabric of the Bible. Why are words important even over images? I made a comment about Deuteronomy chapter 4, the importance of not worshiping the image, but understanding that the two of them do actually go together and that there are so many images in the Bible that we need books to help us unpack all of them. And then how will, we, how will seeing threads in the First Testament teaching change how we think about the Bible? Well, I hope that it does. I hope that we begin to think about it differently and look at it differently and begin to see these ideas that are woven through Scripture, which have tremendous theological power, but as we've already indicated, have tremendous application throughout life. Not only antithetic to our culture, but the driving force behind things like doing good as a sacrifice to God. We've got a few minutes for questions, thoughts. Well, and I was thinking at the beginning, we, uh, you know, we presented that they were ashamed and they wanted covering, and our culture is definitely going back to we're not ashamed. Um, we don't care about the covering any longer. But as Christians, we need to thinking about and meditating about how are we going to um, present that to this to the other people, the sinners that even David talked about in the, in the sermon today, how are we going to present that? Judgmental or with the love of Christ? And how are we going to show that we do need the covering today and that we do need to be ashamed of our sin, but we can't make them, or we have to know how we're going to present that to them. Not, just putting shame upon them, showing the covering and all of the right. Yeah. 
great comments from Robin about the idea that uh, certainly shame shows up early on, but our job is not to make people ashamed. Uh, certainly the gospel does that by itself, but we don't need to add to it. Actually, it's interesting that you mention that because it makes me think about more of the conversation that I had with a psychologist um, just yesterday morning, actually. And when we were talking, uh, we, we talked about the idea that uh, asking questions is the most powerful idea in psychology and getting people to <coughs> admit to their own concerns, their own shame, uh, rather than uh, seeking to point it out to them in judgment. You hear this phrase, by the way, it makes me think about this. We hear this phrase all the time on television movies or just in conversation. Well, you know, I don't want to judge. Well, okay, but as soon as you say that, I'm going to ask you this question. So on what basis is there any kind of judgment? How can we say that something is right or wrong in the culture? Or that we think that something that was, fin that was done was wrong? Who would say, for instance, that uh, the shooting in Las Vegas, where almost 60 people uh, were killed, how could we say that we don't stand in judgment on that? So this concept of having personal relationship to attract people to the gospel, Titus 2.10, it's exactly what Robin's talking about, but helping people to come to the knowledge of understanding that judgment actually does have a standard. Our job is not to do that, though. Our job is to love people. Other questions, comments? Do you think that in the story of Adam and Eve, when they ate the forbidden fruit, that that was or is some kind of a metaphor for sexual sin? Uh, is the eating of the f forbidden fruit some kind of metaphor for sexual sin? Uh, it is a statement about all sin. Doesn't matter what kind it is. Uh, I wouldn't just, I, I wouldn't uh, allow it to be just seen as one category. In this case, a sexual sin. I've, this idea of eating the apple, the disobedience against God, is a rebellion against God's law. And that's the bottom line. On this uh, idea of sacrifices, uh, I've been reading a lot about St. Patrick lately, and uh, when he went back to Ireland as a bishop, he began working with the heathen, the Druids, and he discovered they were sacrificing their children, like I would fact sacrifice my child to appease the God for my sin. And I got to think about that. That's a lot of how this thing of work salvation works, and especially. But he was able to take that and show them that Christ was a perfect sacrifice, that they didn't need to be doing that because God had already provided that for them, which I think is a great. That's a fantastic connection uh, to how the Irish saved civilization. And the concept of St. Patrick uh, talking to the Druids about their sacrificing of their own children was not going to appease uh, any god at all. Uh, it makes me think of, of course, in the First Testament, uh, the god that was sacrificed, you sacrificed your children to Moloch. And this was one of the, one of the worst of all of the gods uh, that you could think of in First Testament teaching. But we see this throughout uh, history, and uh, we see it uh, in places uh, like the Aztecs and the Mayans did this. Um, we see it in places like uh, any totalitarian regime which sacrifices its people, sacrifices its people simply to win a war, or uh, we see this in North Korea right now where uh, impoverished poor people are being sacrificed uh, without being fed so that uh, the leadership can continue, you know, things like this. But I would go so far as to say it this way, that lest we think that we are without sin in this nation. All I need point to is the issue of abortion. And we are doing exactly the same kinds of things in our culture that people would rail against in any other culture. But we cast a blind eye to it because we want what we want. Anyone else? One last question, comment? You know, kind of uh, following up on Robin's uh, insightful comment, just an observation that uh, the whole concept of shame as it is presented in the, uh, in the Old Testament, or First Testament, excuse me, um, is something that is, that is very, very weighty. And, and I don't want to get into 
political discussion, but in today's current uh, climate in our culture, the use of the term shame is very common, almost generic, and it, it, it makes me wonder, um, is it being minimalized uh, or, or public, you know, public gain? but making reference to the gravity of it. Um, Any one of us who has truly felt shame knows that it is worse than just being disappointed about having said something that might offend someone else. Mm -hmm. It is much, much more deeply impactful than hurting someone's feelings. Yes. Right? And, I, and I, I wonder how our culture has manipulated that concept. Uh, the idea of shame uh, in our culture has taken a, a new priority, but in not, not a biblical way. Uh, we live in an emotive culture. We are driven by the emotion of the moment. You read or watch any social media, uh, anything. If you are interested in having a fight online with somebody, boy, go ahead, because it's all out there, you know, this emotive culture. So we're trying to shame people into these kinds of uh, feeling bad about whatever it is that we believe. Again, yesterday I was speaking with a friend who happens to be uh, politically liberal. And he actually goes on conservative, politically conservative websites uh, to point out the problems uh, with people making comments that they do which are way over the top, extreme, pendulum swinging life left to the right. Uh, and my only question to, to him was, do you see the same thing happening on the left? Do you see the same thing happening in liberal uh, talk areas, whether in social media or elsewhere. And he readily admitted, absolutely. When we talk about the issue of politics, we're really talking about the issue of human nature and human condition. And it's not, these issues are not about left, right, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative. It is always, always, always about the human heart. And the problem is in here, not out there. Thanks ever so much for being here again this week. See you next week.